In a biological system, it is of the utmost importance that acid and base be balanced in certain ways. Now, if we look at the pH balance for a normal mesophile, that is a microorganism that grows um, generally in tissues of a human or animal, they're going to want a pH of 7, uh, relatively neutral. And as we see on the screen, most organisms grow between 6.5 and 8.5. Um, and this varies based on the types of wastes that they pr produce, or if they're more acidic, or where they like to live. So, for example, if they like to live in soil, they generally can survive more alkaline conditions. Or if they live in the gut of some organism or uh, animal, uh, they're going to like it a little bit more acidic. So the concentration of hydrogen uh, protons in a solution is expressed as pH. And so the negative log 10 of the hydrogen is pH. So increasing hydrogen availability increases acidity, whereas increasing hydroxide um, levels increases alkalinity, or uh, the basic properties. So as you go higher on the pH scale, you get more ba uh, basic. As you go lower, you get more acidic. And this is just some examples. So we have human blood uh, right here in the 7.5 range whereas we see that urine is acidic, and that is important because as you urinate any microorganisms that might be existing in your urethra, uh, the acidity of your urine helps dislodge and remove those microorganisms to keep urine nice and um, sterile. Uh, and then we can look at like stomach acid, which is very low pH, and most microorganisms uh, do not survive the stomach acid, but some have evolved uh, mechanisms that allow them to survive it for short periods of time. Uh, in fact, H. pylori, which causes peptic ulcers, often can just live in your stomach because it secretes a neutralizing enzyme that allows it to live in actually neutral pH while it continues to grow, even though the stomach acid around it is uh, quite acidic. So organic compounds commonly contain hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Now the reason why we have nitrogen in some compounds is because humans can't make use of atmospheric nitrogen. So we have to consume our nitrogen. And oftentimes the way we consume our nitrogen is through food. So microorganisms can fix atmospheric nitrogen, put it in the soil. Other organisms and plants can make use of it which then make proteins. We in turn eat either the animal or plant-based proteins, and that's how we get our source of carbon. But a chain of carbon atoms in an organic molecule is often referred to as a carbon skeleton. Functional groups bond to the carbon skeleton and are responsible for most of the chemical properties of a particular organic compound. So here we have uh, methanol with the hydroxyl attached to the methane group instead of being just methane, it's methanol. We have ethanol, which is a common social libation. You might know it as vodka. Um, we have uh, two carbons here, eth, and this gives us the all. If this was just a hydrogen, it would be ethane, uh, but it is ethanol because it's got that alcohol component. Now, for those of you who like rubbing alcohol, we have isopropyl alcohol, and the reason it's called isopropyl is because the alcohol is in the middle, uh, creating the uh, mirror images on either side. Now, when we're looking at amino acid, and remember, an amino acid is how we get nitrogen in a biological system. We don't fix nitrogen. We are not in the family rhizobia, right? So we have to eat it, either from plants or animals. So in any amino acid, you're going to have your amine group, which is your NH2, okay? And you're also going to have your carboxyl group, which is a hydroxide and a double bonded oxygen. So small molecules can combine into large molecules. Macromolecules are polymers consisting of many small repeating uh, molecules called monomers. Monomers join by dehydration synthesis and um, or condensation depending on how it's being joined so we this r represents some carbon chain over here this r represents some carbon chain 
notice they have two hydroxyls. Now, if the temperature or enzymes are just right, what ends up happening is you create water. And these two join to form some type of polymer or monomer. So carbohydrates. These are uh, structures for cells. Um, so you have uh, structural carbohydrates such as starch, which is found in potatoes, things like that. And then you have chitin, which is, again, a structural uh, carbohydrate that is found in many insects. So, again, sugars and starches consist of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Notice there's no nitrogen in this formula. Uh, many carbohydrates are, in fact, isomers, molecules with the exact same chemical formula, but slightly different structures, which is interesting because if, let's say, you can digest glucose, but uh, lactose, which has a different chemical structure, have the same chemical formula but different structure. The enzyme may not work on lactose, which leads to your lactose intolerance. Monosaccharides, simple sugars with three to seven carbon atoms. Glucose and deoxyribose are examples of common uh, monosaccharides. Disaccharides are formed when two monosaccharides are uh, joined via dehydration synthesis. So disaccharides can be uh, broken down by hydrolysis. So what we're basically saying is in the previous example, when we looked at the structure, we created water, which means we dehydrated. Now, if you are looking at a disaccharide and you add water to the system with sufficient heat or whatever reactant enzyme you're using, then hydrolysis will happen and the water will break those bonds between those disaccharides. So here we have the dehydration, again, water being removed, and the hydrolysis, water being added. So depending on the temperature and the presence or absence of enzymes, you have these reactions going back and forth in a biological system. Polysaccharides consist of tens or hundreds of monosaccharides joined through dehydration. So we're looking at things like starch, glycogen, dextran, and cellulose. Uh, these are all different structural sugars uh, that uh, are polymers of glucose that differ in their bonding. So if we're looking at lipids, uh, lipids, so sugars are hydrophilic, which means they love water. Well, lipids are hydrophobic. They're non-polar, uh, and they are insoluble in water. Fats or triglycerides contain the glycerol uh, and a fatty acid and are formed by dehydration synth synthesis. So you have these long carbon chains. Uh, this is the polymer. You have your carboxyl group and your glycerol up here. Saturated fats, uh, no double bonds. Um, unsaturated fats, one or more double bonds. And what's interesting is that if you tried to use an unsaturated fat in a lipid bilayer, the cell membrane would be unstable because there's not as much rigidity. Here you have a saturated fat. Notice the long chain. Well, those can be stacked side by side next to each other, creating a stable wall. So here we have uh, two molecules, right, of saturated and one of unsaturated. Notice how the cis configuration can alter the structure of the fat molecule. Well, if you're using that for a plasma membrane, it's not going to create the most uh, stable structure. Complex lipids uh, contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, maybe phosphorus, nitrogen, or sulfur, depending on the system. Cell membranes are made up of complex lipids called phospholipids, which is glycerol with two fatty acids and a phosphate group. Phospholipids have a polar as well as nonpolar region. And so here you can see the saturated fatty acids closely stacked up, creating a nice rigid or semi-rigid structure. Whereas if we look at the unsaturated portion, you can see that it is less structured and it's likely that that um, plasma membrane would fall apart. Now sterols, uh, we can see that fungi use these sterols impregnated throughout their plasma membrane and their phospholipids to give rigidity to their structure. Now steroids, again, are hydrophobic which means they don't like water. They're four carbon rings with a hydroxyl group. Um, 
part of membranes that keep membranes fluid. So there is a generic steroid structure. Uh, proteins, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. When it's sulfur-based, we say that they have cysteine uh, arms or cysteine units. Uh, essential in cell structure and function. These can be made up of uh, enzymes that speed up chemical reactions. They can be transporter proteins. They can be structures in flagella that aid movement. And some bacterial toxins are in fact made of proteins. Which means that if the area in which the environment was, or the bacteria was growing, was deficient of a specific type of protein, that bacteria may not be able to make the toxin necessary uh, to make you sick. That's why most bacteria make their own amino acids um, and they build them. Protein consists of subunits called, again, amino acids. And amino acids contain an alpha carbon that has an attached carboxyl group, amino group, and side group. And so we see the cyclic group right here. This is tyrosine. What's fun about tyrosine is while it is an essential amino acid, if you get tyrosine in too high of dose, it turns into a neurotoxin. So if you overdose on tyrosine or phenylalanine, you can get headaches or have some type of brain damage. So these are the just the structures of the different amino acids. They share similar properties. Some of them are hydrophilic, some of them are hydrophobic, uh, some of them carry a charge, some of them don't, um, some of them are, react more, some of them don't. Uh, here we see the heterocyclic uh, tryptophan, right? This is a very expensive amino acid to produce, but as you can see, it is a precursor to building DNA. So we can see some uh, dual structures here that look like they can be uh, used in nucleotides. So amino acids exist in either two stereoisomers, D or L. L is often found in nature, and most of the things that we use are in fact in L isomer. However, most bacteria have D isomers in the form of sugars in their cell wall. Because D isomers do not naturally occur in the human body, the body by default recognizes and destroys them. Now, the L and D is um, isomers of an amino acid are shown here. Now, what's really interesting about this is that you can have D amino acid help your body, uh, I'm sorry, L, uh, L amino acid help your body be nutritious. D amino acid could, protect, uh, could potentially destroy your body. Their chemical structure is identical. However, the arrangement of their molecules are mirror images of each other. Now, an excellent example of this is the drug Accutane. Accutane is a chiral molecule to vitamin A. So your body thinks it can use it like vitamin A for your skin. Um, in fact, your body tries to use it like vitamin A fails to and your skin cells start falling apart and dying faster, which causes skin to uh, peel. Well, if you have acne, it's great because it prevents the acne from forming, but um, it also does some serious damage to your liver as well as other body systems because the rest of your body tries to use that chemical as vitamin A, but it is a chiral version of it. Peptide bonds are between amino acids, and they're formed just like the sugar dehydration synthesis. You can see uh, glycine and alanine there. Dehydration synthesis, water is formed, and you have your peptide bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. That's what makes it a peptide bond. So you have several structures of proteins, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So primary is very simple. It is just a peptide chain. Secondary occurs when the amino acids start to fold or form a pleated sheet. And tertiary structures, we're going to talk about more in class. These are things like hemoglobin, right? That's a tertiary structure. You can see, or the, actually, the tertiary structure is a mix of he, uh, helix and pleated. The quaternary structure consists of two or more. And this is when we have several proteins coming together um, to form a complex structure. So we're going to go over and talk a little bit more about these in class, but I thought I would provide you this intro right here to help you along your way.